Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay. We have a very, uh, a very full session to begin with, which is good because then you have time to wake up. I hope you have coffee. Uh, we have a very full session, so I'm, uh, I'm going to get this started. Uh, this is developing with, uh, with PDF chip, and we have four topics. Uh, both of us are going to do two of those to keep it interesting. We're doing different ones. We're doing different, yeah, it's not a repeat of the <laughs> same topic. <laughs> um, we're going to talk a little bit about development environments, then uh, something about uh, snippets, whatever that is, that's Olaf's topic. Um, then uh, templates and how to make your life a little easier and then uh, debugging tricky code. No demonstrations, it's a little bit too early in the morning and we don't have, uh, we have too, much, too many slides to, uh, to share. Um, I, if you work with PDF chip, then uh, I'm, I think there will be a couple of things that will be very interesting. If you haven't worked with PDF chip but you've looked at it, this should make your life a lot easier if you uh, to get started with that. Who has done some development with PDF chip so far? Okay, a little bit more than fifty percent. Good. Not bad. Although a lot of uh, Kalas people who put their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating, I think. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me get started with uh, with this. Uh, the first topic is about development environment. And now I know that different people have different tastes, and you all used to something else but I still wanted to share some of the things uh, in this case that that I'm doing uh, so you can use anything but I'm using sublime uh, if you're not using sublime then this is not going to be very useful uh, if you don't know what to use yet or you're using a regular text editor then this might might be interesting um, there are some reasons why I'm using Sublime. The first one is it's a very nice text editor, meaning it will not screw up your files or put anything in there that you don't want. It does syntax <coughs> coloring. Uh, there are plugins for it that do all kinds of fancy stuff. It's fast even for uh, large files. It won't crash if you by accident click a PDF file, but it shows you the PDF uh, content quite nicely actually. Um, if you work with, uh, with PDF chip, you're going to work with HTML and CSS and uh, JavaScript and all of these things. And it has very good support for all of those. So you get, like I said, syntax coloring that is, that is really good. It helps as well. But what is the main reason I use it is um, support for folders and the, uh, the build system that they, uh, that they have. And maybe starting with, uh, with folders, this is just opening a, uh, an HTML file that looks like what you are used to in, in many text editors. It opens the HTML and it does, uh, well, it does syntax coloring and you can uh, set the tab size, which helps, but other than that, it's uh, not very, very special. But what is interesting then is that you can drag <coughs> folders in there. So on the left-hand side, you have this this pane where you have the open files that you're editing. And by the way, I don't know whether I mentioned that somewhere else, but if you change a file and you close Sublime, it will not save the file for you, but it will remember your edits. So when you reopen it, you still have what you were working on without having to actually save the file in the meantime, which is really cool sometimes. But you have the open files that you're working with, and under there you have this folders section. And you can just grab a folder in, uh, in the finder and drag it into that uh, section on the left and then it is displayed as you see it uh, there. And that's very nice when you have a PDF chip template because typically you have an HTML file and then you have all kinds of uh, folders with um, fonts and images and uh, CSS and JavaScript uh, and so on. You can drag as many folders as you, uh, as you want in there. So uh, what I typically do when I work with place content, for example, is I open the main folder that has all of the place content templates in it. And that makes it easy in this uh, left-hand side section to click open the ones that you're working with and copy paste in between different place content uh, templates. So that is, uh, that is relatively uh, nice. Um, you can also use it to open up the documentation uh, if, uh, if, if you want to look at something. 
uh, you can open a folder with test data and, and that is actually what I do when I'm when I'm working on a PDF chip template you uh, typically you have test PDF files that you want to do something with or you have test JSON or XML files you put all that stuff in a folder you drag that in there as well and that gives you easy access to uh, to anything now Folders by itself are nice, but what is even nicer is that you can save that as a project in, uh, in Sublime. It's taken me a while to get to the point of using them, but once you start using them, it's hard to, uh, to not have it anymore. So you simply open up the files that you want, you drag in the folders that you want, and then you can save that as a project, which gives you two files somewhere in your file system, one called Sublime Project, the other one called Sublime Workspace. The project remembers uh, which folders you have open and your settings and so on. The workspace remembers Windows settings and everything else. Opening up um, a project in Sublime reopens that window with all the folders on the left-hand side and you can just start where you, uh, where you left off the, uh, the previous time. So that's a very nice, uh, nice feature. Um, like I said, it also saves your open files. If I start editing a, uh, a JavaScript and I'm, uh, I'm distracted and I have to do something else, you can close this project. Later on, when you come back to it, you'll get the exact same state as where you left off, including any, ed any edits in that, uh, in that JavaScript. And you can still decide to close it without saving if, uh, if that's what you want at that point. But it saves an exact copy of what you're uh, working with. Now, these folders and so on are, uh, are nice, but there is an additional reason why I, uh, I like them, and that's the build system. Uh, Sublime has a build system uh, built in, no pun intended, and it, it works out of the box for a number of different things. So if you're used to working with uh, C or C++ code, for example, it can be configured to uh, actually compile and then make the, the project that you're working on. That doesn't help much for, uh, for PDF chip because PDF chip, of course, is not known out of the box by uh, Sublime. But you can make your own build system and then it becomes very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And there are um, a, a couple of ways you can, uh, you can actually do that. Um, and here's the first approach and we've shared this in the past at some point. Uh, I think Ulrich uh, made the, uh, the first example of, uh, of this. Uh, thank you, by the way. Um, this is the first approach. So you build, uh, you, you create a build system that works for HTML files. And what you do is you tell Sublime that whenever there is an HTML file that you're editing, it needs to, and you, you say build, command B in Sublime, then uh, it needs to invoke PDF chip on that HTML file and then um, it saves the result in the same folder as the HTML. So you basically have an index.html, you say build, and it will create an index.pdf next to the HTML file. What is annoying about that, and uh, I got bitten by that uh, a lot of times to the point where I uh, decided I needed something else. What is very annoying is that this works when you're in the HTML file, of course, but when you're working with PDF chip, you're very frequently not editing the HTML, you're editing the CSS, you're editing the, uh, the JavaScript. It's especially annoying for CSS because CSS is a nightmare, uh, so you have to change it 15 times and every time you hit build and you forget that you're actually not in the HTML. And, uh, so that doesn't work very well. The other thing that doesn't work very well is PDF chip supports all kinds of special parameters on the command line. You can pass uh, JSON files in there and so on. And uh, if you make a, a generic build system that just looks at the HTML and compiles it with PDF chip, then that doesn't work. You can't easily pass special parameters or you would have to change the build system for every file that you're, every project that you're working on. So that was a limitation that I didn't like uh, uh, either. There's a second approach. And what you're looking at is the, the complete build system uh, in this case, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's uh, kind of minimalistic, but it works very well. And it uses the folders that you have in, uh, in, in, in Sublime. So remember that I said you can have many folders in there. What this does is set the working directory to the first folder that you have in your Sublime project. 
So you can have as many as you want, but one of them is the, the first one, the topmost folder in that, uh, in that list. Well, Sublime will set its working directory to the first folder in that list. And then it runs a shell command. It looks in that folder that is the first folder in your project. And it looks for a file called run.sh. That's a, a shell file that you place into that folder. And that will get executed. Right? That means if you have uh, five different PDF chip templates, in each of these template folders, you place a run.sh file, and Sublime simply calls that. Why would you do that? Well, there are a couple of uh, advantages. I should stop telling things that are on the next slide, but uh, there's a couple of advantages here. Uh, every time you hit Command B for build, uh, first of all, Sublime is going to save all of your changes. That's really important because uh, well, if you don't, then you forget that your CSS file hasn't been changed yet and you wonder why it's not working. So that's, this is a really good thing. But the most important thing is that in this run.sh file, it's a script that you're calling. You're not doing something on the file that you're currently editing. You're always calling that particular script that is in that folder. So whether you're working in the CSS or the JavaScript or whatever, it doesn't matter. It will always do that script that you have in there. And then in that run.sh file, you can specify the command line that you want. So if I'm working on a PDF chip project that needs a JSON file passed in, you have this import command in PDF chip that lets you do that then I can put that exact command in the run.sh file. And for that project, it will run PDF chip, importing the JSON file, and it will uh, do what you uh, want it to do. Right? So it's a much more flexible way of doing it. And by the way, it's a, it's a script, a command script uh, file, or a shell script file. So what I typically do is I run PDF chip, and then I have a command to open the PDF file that is generated as well which makes it very convenient because you update the CSS, you hit command B, and it opens up the resulting PDF file. And of course, it's not good, so you close it, you do another edit, and then you do it again. But it makes for a very fast uh, cycle. And that means that a lot of the annoying things in, uh, in editing CSS files, for example, where you have small incremental updates is taken away because you can, you can do this very, uh, very quickly. So what's the content of this one? The content of the run.sh is whatever you want it to be, but typically it will be uh, a call to PDF chip with the file that you, are, uh, that you want. And because the working directory is the folder that you're in anyway, it will just be uh, dot uh, slash uh, index.html or something like that. And then the output file dot slash result.pdf and any spe special parameters that you want to pass along. And that generates the PDF. What I typically do is I have an additional line that says open result.pdf and that opens it in uh, whatever is set as your default uh, PDF viewer, which in my case is preview, so it's fast. Um, but you can do whatever you want in there. You could uh, also delete the PDF file first so that you're mm -hmm. sure you're not looking at an older version or you can, you can do whatever you want. It's a script file. It's pretty flexible. You have to use the complete file name or path, but the advantage is this command that you have in the build system sets the working directory to folder, so you're actually inside that first folder, which means that you can do the full path to PDF chip that you have to do, but then it is uh, dot slash uh, index.html and that works. But you can use full paths if you want as well, but you don't have to. So in, in fact, the, uh, the run.sh that I use for, for common PDF chip templates, it's always the same. It's only when you have special parameters that you want to pass that are specific for that template, then you have to modify it. But it's, it's pretty much copy-paste uh, usually. Yeah? Good. If someone comes up with a, a, a build system version 3, please. Thank you. So, big question: Will this be will, will this show up on the online documentation site? 
someone asks me nicely, I will put it there. I'm asking nicely. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's, by the way, the idea that I was uh, explaining yesterday about online documentation that we plan to, whenever we have something like this, like yeah. this is how you do it, uh, and maybe take hours to find out yourself, and it might only take five minutes to read it and <clears throat> understand it right away, uh, we will try to put it on the online yes, documentation. So, and it's constantly growing. So how, by when do you do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk this over some more. Yes. <laughs> Okay, another one, um, and it's, it's a very simple idea, um, and I started using this myself, and I, I thought, well, it's extremely useful to me when playing around with PDF chip, it's probably useful to other people as well, and why should all of you just create that same collection of useful code snippets? So what do, that, do I mean by that? I do mean something that looks as boring as this. This is a long uh, HTML file I have in my system, or I used to have in my system, where I put all kinds of small pieces with some code uh, that does something, that creates barcode. That specifies a spot color in CSS that uses a certain JavaScript call. And I think normally you find that when you're working with PDF for a while, you find that you're using the same things again and again. But still, you can't, sometimes you can't exactly remember how do you specify the parameter for the barcode, like the additional parameter, and what's its exact name, and what are the values that are acceptable. And of course, you could look it up in the reference manual and, or find it in some previous project. But for me, it turned out it was much easier to just compile um, a list um, of such snippets and always have that uh, file ready. Um, I, I made it a little bit nicer uh, now for, for sharing um, and it does, it does contain a couple of things like how do you specify page size and page geometry. So we, you do this over and over again but at least for me it's like the next time I do it I, I'm not exactly sure how to write it down. And was it like is the trim box, uh, is it lower left upper right or is it lower left and then width and height of the uh, trim box, things like that, details. And you can lose a lot of time if you forget about the exact specifics of a given parameter, you may be chasing down a problem you would not have had you written it down correctly right away. Um, so again, this is the overview of what's inside. Um, you, can, you, you can find out how to define fonts. It's not that it's rocket science, but at least for me, I'm not coding all every day. I'm, I'm just doing it occasionally. I may not remember exactly how it's done in, in CSS. Placing PDF pages. Yes, you can place the third page of the PDF file and you can also define a, a crop box so to speak so you, you can only take part of uh, the page you're importing but exactly how do you write this down? Rotation and other transforms it's not even something that has to do with PDF chip proper it's just plain CSS how do you write down a transform like scale or rotate or whatever uh, PDF chip color definitions spot colors device do, does anybody of you exactly know how to write down a device N Color. <laughs> I think you understand. Or things that in the PDF world are called um, extended graphic state parameters. So some are controllable by official CSS attributes and, and others are not. So there's no overprint in CSS except inside the world of PDF chip. Then again, my favorite uh, topic, barcode objects. Especially now that in PDF toolbox 9.1, uh, in PDF chip 1.2 and by implication PDF toolbox 9.1, for place content. We are supporting many more uh, sub-parameters for creating barcodes. Like it's a total of over 200 pieces of, of parameters that you may have to look at. These are all listed in, in this file. Um, and then even something as simple as a boilerplate HTML file, like a, the smallest meaningful HTML or SVG file that you might want to start coding something new, where you have the uh, encoding is UTF-8 things and uh, proper start of the... So I see many files in support where it's just saying HTML and, uh, and not anything of the, the stuff that they should be writing down. And occasionally this can lead to a problem. So if the encoding is not defined as UTF-8, in some cases maybe you don't get UTF-8, you get something else and it might not be what you want. Anyway, so this is what the pieces look like. So it's just one section about the page size and, and page geometry boxes. 
or how to place uh, the PDF page onto your HTML page. Uh, you don't have to read this, it's just to give you an, an idea. Then again, uh, defining uh, colors in, uh, in CSS um, with all the PDF chip specific options, uh, like device M, um, extended graphic states parameters, barcode stuff, and so on. So th this uh, collection of snippets can be found in the online documentation for PDF chip. So it's been sitting there already for a week or so, I, I guess. And I will probably update it over time if, whenever I run into something interesting that I think should be part of it. So sh you should go and, and grab that and have a look at it and maybe you find it useful as well. Which brings us to the next oh. topic. I was going to ask whether it was part of the online documentation. <laughs> <laughs> I was prepared. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the annoying things uh, in PDF chip is that it uses HTML. And HTML can be kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. So it's, uh, there, there, there are some things that you can do to make your life easier. And um, I've tried to collect the ones that I run into anyway. Uh, there might be a bunch of others. And we can gather that in the online documentation, I think. That sounds like a very good idea. Sounds like a good plan. So the first thing I wanted to, to bring up uh, and believe me, uh, all of the PDF chip templates I've written, uh, I don't do all of these things yet. It's something that you learn as you go along. The last one probably has most of these things in it, but uh, people get older and wiser, I guess. Uh, this is the first, uh, the first tip, and that is that uh, all HTML elements have um, margins and padding. Do you know what the default margins are for text elements? And for images and so on. It's sometimes, sometimes the answer is very surprising and very annoying. And what you, you have to remember when you start to work with the PDF chip is that you're not making a website. I mean, most, most of these default settings that are in the style sheet that comes with the, uh, the browser, most of these settings have been uh, put in there because they make sense for a website. Uh, in, in the way that if you don't do anything, you get a website that looks more or less okay. But that's, but that's not, not what you're doing for PDF chip. In PDF chip, very often you want very precise positioning and so on. So you're not dealing with a, a, a normal web page. So in many cases, it makes sense to uh, kind of overwrite the default settings that you have in the, in the web browser. These margins and so on, and so on are, are, are one thing. It's, uh, in many cases, it's easier to simply remove all of the margins and the padding. And at least you know that they are zero. And you can set margins and padding for those elements where you really need them. It gives you kind of a, a, a more predictable way of doing that. And the, the default way of doing that is um, um, to do something like this. You can do all kinds of other things, but CSS has a, a very nice uh, way with a universal selector, which is this little asterisk. If you specify that, then you're, uh, you're targeting all elements in, uh, in existence, at least in existence in your HTML file. And you're telling it's margin and padding should be zero. And you don't have to have measurements. There's a whole very complicated discussion online whether it's uh, whether there should be pixels there or something like that. But I think the consensus is that it's better not to have it. I don't understand why exactly, because I didn't want to spend that much time on my weekend. But um, that seems to be the, cons the, the consensus uh, on there. This looks at all you have in your HTML, and it will put both margins and padding to zero. And because, because this is cascading style sheets, sheet, of course, you can have other elements after this that set margins, margins again for a particular element. But this gives you a clean slate. So that's, so that's one. The second one, the second one this is a very annoying problem in, uh, in, in, uh, caused by PDF chip in a way, is that uh, if you don't do something for a background color, you might very well end up with a white background color that you don't see, but it's still white. And because you don't do anything, it's an RGB white which is kind of annoying if you're trying to make a PDFX file, for example. At least PDFX one here. Um, 
So, so you, don't want, you don't want that to happen, which means that, means that uh, specifically, specifically what is always there is the body element in HTML. Specifically for that one, you want to make sure that the, the background of that body element is not white. And the best way to do it is to set it to uh, transparent. Now, with what I've shown before, you can do two things. The bottom one is perhaps the safest one in this case that looks at the body element, which is the uh, main, main element you have in each uh, HTML document, and it simply sets the background color to transparent. The top one is, again, that universal selector, so that will set the background color for all elements in your file to transparent that might have side effects that you don't want in specific cases. I haven't really tested all of it, but I can imagine that if you work with uh, form fields or if you, you want to add a checkbox somewhere or something like that, a little bit more exotic perhaps, that you might ruin the visual effect of some of these elements. So I would be a little bit uh, more conservative with that, and I will probably go for I go for the, the bottom one in, the, in my templates anyway. There is another very uh, exciting feature in PDF chip, and that is that it does pagination. Uh, uh, not the same as a browser, which shows everything in one go. PDF chip always has a, um, a page size. And in the, the last uh, PDF camp, we specified a very nice half hour trying to predict what PDF chip would do for different cases. Um, but it always has a page size and it will generate multiple pages. Sometimes you don't want that. You want to, to generate one single page of a specific size. And PDF chip will give you two pages. And it's caused by rounding errors and so on. But it, you'll end up with two pages. And that, that can be very annoying. There's a couple of ways you can fix this. Uh, Olaf showed the, uh, the way to specify um, Trim boxes and so on in the uh, in the snippets. Well, there is one thing that you can do to make sure that you end up with the correct page and you don't get that extra page. And it is to set the size of the document itself slightly larger. So this is supposed to be a four, which should be two nine seven and then two ten. So what I do here is I set the size of my generated file two millimeters larger, one millimeter of each side. Right. And then I specify a trim box, and the trim box is set to be one millimeter origin, and then the correct width and height. And that kind of scales it down again. And if you have, if you really have small rounding errors, that will make sure that you don't generate that extra page that otherwise might be that might be an issue. Now, there's another thing you can do in PDF chip, and is uh, at least if you're using JavaScript. So if you're using the uh, C chip print loop function that, that controls how pagination is done and when, then you can, then you can uh, at some point you need to call uh, C chip print pages, which is a function that takes your HTML at that point and outputs it into PDF. And it didn't used to be like that in the first version of PDF chip, or at one point I think, but at the moment print pages has a, you can add a number to that, and that is the number of pages that gets output. So if I do print pages one, I always get one page, regardless of what the HTML is converted to, I always get one page as the, uh, as the output. Both techniques are valid. Some techniques work better in, uh, in some templates than others, but you can use both ways to control how many pages of output you get in a PDF chip template. And then the last one, I think. This is how an HTML element uh, looks. I said every HTML element has um, padding and, and margin. And I showed how to zero those out. Every HTML element that you're looking at is really a box. And that's the, uh, the cornerstone of understanding how HTML works. You're always dealing with boxes. Even if you're looking at, uh, at text, the text is in a box. And it has padding and it has margin. And in between, the element that is not named is the border. And the border can have a certain size as well. You can set that as well. Right, so for each right, element, you're looking at the contents of your element itself, padding, rounded, padding, rounded border, and border, and then margin. What's the difference, What's the difference between padding and margin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the consequence of that? Padding gets the background 
padding gets the background color of your element. Margin does not. Right, so if you want to have um, white text on the red background, and you want to make the red bigger, you want to make the spacing outside of the red bigger, you do that with margin. That's the only difference. Now, what's the width and height of that element? If you work in traditional HTML context, this is what is width and height. So if you look at an HTML element and you ask it through JavaScript what its width and height is, then you will get the width of the actual element and you get the height of the actual element. That sounds logical, right? I want an element that is uh, 3 centimeters high by 10 centimeters wide. Kind of logical that the answer will be I am three centimeters and ten centimeters. What is really annoying is that the padding is not taken into account for it, and the border is not taken into account for that either. So if I have an element and I tell the element it's three by ten, and then somehow I have some padding that gets uh, set in my CSS, then the element will actually appear to be bigger because padding still needs to be added to that. That's very annoying, and that's very annoying if you do absolute positioning in, uh, in, in the templates. You can fix that, you can fix that however. Um, this is one of the good things that came out of um, Internet Explorer. There aren't many, but this is one. Um, the reason that you have this is because of what is called the border box model, the box model in, in HTML. And that box model defines what is the height and what is the, uh, the width. And most web browsers today, if you don't do anything special, they will do this. But by using a CSS setting called box sizing, and by changing that to border box, you can change the definition of what is being uh, done. And the effect will be this. So instead of the width being calculated as only the width of the element, if you do that CSS trick, the width will include the padding and the border. And it actually makes a lot of sense. It means that if I specify something on my page that is 10, 3 by 10, I set some, some padding in it, then the padding is going to be part of the 3 by 10. So and otherwise, my element never changes size. It's just calculated internally. If I make my box bigger, the, 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 the actual carton of the box bigger, then I have less space in, inside the box. It kind of makes sense. For positioning, if you start playing with this, especially if you have a complicated CSS around it with margins and paddings that are set in action, this can actually make it much simpler to, to do calculations and to make sure you only have to do them once. Yes. Okay. Next on uh, in line is um, <coughs> concepts around debugging your PDF chip code. And there's a few bits um, I wanted to share with you. Some of them relatively straightforward and easy, and some a little bit more advanced. Uh, so I'm talk going to talk about briefly about uh, writing log statements in your code, about damping uh, dumping um, static HTML out of your dynamic. Uh, PDF chip HTML files and then last but not least uh, the browser extension that we have already mentioned for Chrome. So th th this is so, so easy it's often missed uh, especially if you're not um, if you're not like really experienced doing JavaScript and you're just hacking around a little bit um, and one way to, to find out what's going on inside your code is to write log statements in a couple of places in the JavaScript, um, and then use use console.log and then just put whatever you want to appear on, on standard out uh, inside the uh, value of that uh, log statement. Uh, so if you do some computation and you're not quite sure whether you get the computation right all the time, uh, you could, could write a log statement right after you're computing a value, uh, console.log, and then you put some explanatory text, a string, and then the actual value of the result of that computation. Um, at least for people like me, who, who used to be programmers until almost 20 years ago and don't do much programming anymore, uh, I sometimes overlook um, the easy things. Um, a more interesting one, and we have just added that. Um, 
to PDF chip um, is the possibility um, to dump a static representation of the content uh, in the HTML file at a certain point in time. So especially is if you have a printing loop, like you go through something again and again, and each time you go through the loop, you create another two pages and another two pages and so on. And then you find out after like the 15th iteration of that, something strange happens. So the file number 16, or the, the page number 16 that comes out of your processing is not exactly what you expected it to be. So there's maybe some problem in your, um, in your code. Um, and it would be nice if you could kind of clearly understand what the DOM, the, the internal representation of the content, looks like at that moment, especially if you're working on a 10,000 page file, because then it becomes really cumbersome to find out why after a certain number of iterations, strange things uh, are happening. You can use a command line parameter uh, for PDF chip called minus minus dump minus static minus HTML equal debug and then use the, the usual syntax for the command line. And what it will do, it will create a subfolder where it picks up the, the string debug. This could also be some other string. It could be Monday or Tuesday or uh, the name of your father or whatever. Um, and it uses that and it also appends a timestamp. So actually the Y's should be four Y's because it's usually uh, four digits for the, for the year. A month, day, and then hour, minute, and second of the moment where that uh, folder gets created. Um, so if you if you run PDF chip a couple of times, you will have one such folder each time you run PDF chip with this dumb static HTML command and parameter. This is not something you want to do in production, right? This is for debugging. Just remember that one. So if you call us, hard disk is always full. Check your command line. Um, and then what happens is, if, if you run a PDF chip, it will create HTML files inside this folder each time the print pages call is executed in your JavaScript. So you have your print loop, you do some dynamic adjustments of your content, you create new content, you call um, print pages, then at that moment your uh, internal representation of the HTML content has a certain state and that state gets converted into PDF pages. And that DOM, or that HTML representation, at that moment gets saved out as a static HTML. That HTML will not contain any of the JavaScript anymore, because it's really just writing out the DOM. So it will have the result of all the uh, scripting and manipulation you have carried out in this moment. So in a typical file name, it could look like debug 2016 and so on, as you see on the slide. Um, this was the initial state of the specification for the feature. <laughs> I incidentally found, found the, the photo. So that was, I think, last year in October, November, whenever that was. We sat down and wanted to find out exactly how to get this right. And it, it's very clear, isn't it? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, let me see. Uh, so, this is just an, a code example for using. No, this is what's, what's the other one. I'm mixing things up already. So, I got confused by my own drawing. So, <laughs> this is the command line parameter. So, this is cool if you just want to switch into debugging mode and you want to get uh, static HTML for each of the instances where print pages is called. Um, we have a similar thing that you can trigger from inside your JavaScript code. Um, and, and unsurprisingly, it has a relatively similar name, but it's a, it's a function you can call um, inside your JavaScript. So it's called cchip dot dump static HTML. And it does more or less the exact same thing. So it, it, it saves out a static representation of, the, of your content in, in that moment. What you can do is, you don't have to wait for the print pages to happen. So maybe you have something interesting going on before you're actually producing pages. And you want to find out exactly what, what it is that is inside your content in that moment. Um, 
So the lines in bold, they, they call dumpstead gauge the argument in between, you change the content. Um, sometimes, changes um, sometimes, sometimes changes can be very complex, and maybe you get one out of five transformations not quite right. Uh, so the object is jumping some other place or it's not ending up where it should be. And it might be very interesting to find out exactly when that is happening. Um, so you can use uh, the, this function uh, anytime you want. Um, and it's just an alternative approach uh, for, for, for capturing the state of your HTML in a given moment. Um, this is what your output would look like. Um, and each time I want to explain exactly how the numbering works uh, for the files, because it looks strange at first glance, uh, highly redundant in many cases, but not in others. Um, and it goes back, how do I get this right? It goes back to the fact that you can have several HTML input files, and you can create several PDF output files with one invocation of PDF chip. So there's called inside, uh, the, the JavaScript syntax for PDF to where you can say, please start a new file. Then you have a second the file. Is, so the numbering is, uh, this one is for the first file, this one is for the second file, you have to help me. <laughs> so then they later on you find out which is which. I have, I have to look this up again. It's in the documentation, by the way. <laughs> So in, in, in a typical case, the numbering will just be synchronous, so it doesn't make a lot of uh, difference. Um, and then the last bit I wanted to, to share is about uh, the PDF chip debug browser extension. Um, so anybody who has ever done any programming for PDF chip in, in JavaScript or HTML and CSS will probably have found that just trying again and again a PDF chip is not the ideal way of fine-tuning your code, you would rather want to have something interactive and um, like a browser for example and the browsers we have today they have nice a nice debugging environment actually so you can inspect the, the HTML code in the browser you can inspect JavaScript as it's happening you can inspect attributes and CSS and everything um, the problem is um, if you run a PDF chip specific HTML file and associated JavaScript and maybe CS, uh, CSS in Safari or Chrome. Some of the stuff simply will not work because Safari or Chrome don't know anything about CChip data objects or PDF chip specific uh, JavaScript functions. So we thought, how can we address that? And we definitely didn't want to write our own debugging environment because it's a lot of work. We want to hijack what you have already in Chrome or Safari. And, and just make it work with PDF chip and HTML. And the approach is relatively simple once you get the hang of it, um, because you can use JavaScript inside Chrome also in, in, for, for debugging purposes. Um, we are emulating most of the functionality that is special to PDF chip. So we have actually in JavaScript written a couple of functions associated with the C chip object that do not do exactly the same as PDF chip because Chrome, Chrome will never become PDF chip. But at least your code does run and it does meaningful things. So if you call print pages now with, with the um, browser extension loaded, Chrome will not start creating PDF pages for you. But it will continue operating. So it, you would just pretend it would have created uh, PDF pages if it were PDF chip, but it's not. But everything else just works more or less the same way. So you can run through a print loop and you can find out what it's doing. Um, you can inspect the state of your DOM in a given moment. Um, you can look at all kinds of values and so on. So it's, it's, I think it's pretty nice. And we started shipping that with uh, PDF chip 1.2. Um, so it's a browser plugin for Chrome. You have to load it um, because this whole area is very sensitive in, in terms of uh, risk, uh, exposing yourself to the internet and whatever. There are relatively strict rules from Google what you can do in a, in a custom uh, browser uh, extension and what you can't do. Um, so one thing, for example, we can, so to make it 
easy to use, we can only provide the extension and source code. That's a security concern that Google has, that if we give you a compiled, which would also be possible, a compiled extension, you could be doing all kinds of harmful things. We could provide a compiled extension if you go through the Google Play Store, so they can do some sanity checks, and then you can download it from there. Uh, we decided anyway to just give you a, a browser extension in, in plain source, but you could even optimize what we are doing there because it's JavaScript inside. Um, you have to load it. Um, you have to allow access to file URL. It still doesn't cut it for all situations. I will get to that in just a second. Uh, Chrome will tell you again and again that you have loaded a browser extension that may be harmful. So please make sure that you trust us or double check the code of the extension. Um, but it's, it's still convenient enough, so you have occasionally have to say, yes, I know I have loaded this special extension, but you can keep going anyway. Um, and it should be quite okay. Um, by the way, we also tried to do this for Safari. So the, the plan was to offer the extension both for Chrome and uh, Safari. For the time being, we are not offering it for Safari because the restrictions are much more tight in Safari regarding local file access and this and that. So it became too much of a pain to make it work in Safari. And so for now, it's, it's really there just for Chrome. Uh, if we figure out a more elegant approach to also make it work in Safari, we will probably come up with it, but for the time being, it looks just too cumbersome. So you load the plugin. Um, actually, when I have, don't have a screenshot for that. It, once inside Google Chrome, you will have, there will be an icon in the upper right um, for the PDF chip uh, browser extension. Um, and you have to activate it because it's not running by default. And that's intentional, so maybe you're doing other stuff in Chrome and maybe it's interfering with that. Um, so you have to enable it and then once inside Chrome you have to activate the functionality of PDF to debug. And then um, if, you, if you use the, the usual inspection features inside Google Chrome for a given HTML file, you can go inside and you have all the bits and pieces. So, um, you can set breakpoints for your JavaScript so each time you go, it, the, the, the HTML goes through that part of the JavaScript, it will stop, you can inspect, you can step in, step forward or step inside a function, step out again. So the usual things you have in debugger are possible. And that works also in, in code that is specific to a PDF chip. Um, then there's one thing, and it's a relative, uh, relatively recent uh, finding. I think Ulrich just shared it on Sunday. <laughs> uh, still, if, if when running inside Chrome and you want to read an arbitrary file, just like a JSON file or an XML file or whatever, Chrome will normally block this out of security concerns. But you can still convince Chrome to allow it anyway by launching Chrome from the command line and using a parameter which is called allow file access from files. So if you have some PDF chip, so PDF chip is more, more relaxed about this because we hope that you understand what you're doing and it's not a browser that just every average person is going to run. Um, um, but if you, if you want to have the same, and, and if you're using, if you're accessing files in PDF chip because you want to read some XML that comes from some other system, uh, or you would want to read some J uh, JSON uh, that you have uh, provided yourself uh, through some other mechanism. Uh, it will work easily in PDF chip, but it would normally be blocked um, inside Chrome. And uh, by setting this command line parameter, you make uh, Chrome less restrictive in this regard. Um, so once, once you're accessing external files from your JavaScript code or whatever, you will need this. Otherwise, this will not really work. This is a command line parameter. You have to you have to do this every time you want to show Yes. For that particular purpose. So I'm, it's probably difficult to read, but if you grab the, the slides after after uh, the event, so what you have to do on, on Mac at least, I don't know exactly how this would work on Windows. Um, you would go to the Google Chrome application. You say show package contents. You have to get the Mac OS folder inside uh, the contents folder in the package, and this is the actual application you have to call in the command line. What you do is you open the terminal, uh, you drag and drop uh, this one to the terminal, so it's having the full path on the right uh, way of, of pointing to the app. 
and then you just add a separate uh, space character this parameter, and you hit return, and it would launch Chrome with exactly that uh, parameter. What you could do is you can create your, your mini shell script uh, and then just run the shell script if you are tired of, uh, of doing this. OK. That's all, folks, for now. Any questions? Is it not? I'll look again. Uh, if you if you search for snippets, you should be able to find it. If if not, I will. It, it may for some reasons maybe we have forgotten to publish the article. <laughs> that would be an easy switch. But I think it's. Let me check. It will be there in one hour. So just search for snippet, and it should show up on the PDF too. Might be. Let, let me double check. It should be there within one hour. It, it already the article exists. It, it may be that it's not being published for some reason. So it's there. So we don't have the misspelled version. We only have the. <laughs> okay, it might be true. Yeah. Okay. I have to look at that again, maybe. But anyway, so yeah. there, there is a search feature in the online documentation, and it turn, it, it's very often useful because a certain piece of documentation could sit in different parts of the documentation structure. I will, again, I will double check, and it should be there within one hour. Just to make everybody else to understand the question, um, you can do di di dynamic things in HTML in, in several ways. So in many cases, you just load the HTML, it is, what it is what it is. But you use a print loop, you want, for example, to change text each time you create pages, and then maybe a barcode each time you print a page, or a picture on, 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 the, on the content each time you, you create a new page. You have to dynamically change content or load resources. Changing content, like text inside the HTML, is always easy, it just works. Uh, changing certain resources, like the barcode object, just has become better. Uh, and there's actually a documentation also in, in the online documentation how you would do that. Uh, because there's a relatively simple trick, you have to replace the object with, with itself. That's kind of the hack for barcode objects and, and such objects. But for images, like really external resources, stuff that is definitely living outside the HTML file, you have to use a slightly different approach. And also, we did a lot of work in this area. Could we sh explain this? In but we have no nothing in the two days where we explain that. If you want to find out a few more details about uh, dynamic loading of resources, like images, for example, the noon session in the smaller room is probably be used, uh, will probably be useful. But there's also online documentation for this aspect. Correct, Dietrich? Yes, good. Uh, so it well, shows exactly how to do this. It's still not as straightforward as some people might want it to be, but it's easier than it used to be in the part where it was a little bit of dancing around uh, that aspect. Okay. Other questions? Other questions? Once, once, twice. <laughs>
Reply is twofold because there's two sides to the, at least two sides to the game. So there's the HTML side to the game, and there's the PDF side to the game. Um, and with the HTML side to the game, I mean the HTML you write that we don't have any control over. Can, so you can write 
HTML and JavaScript and CSS that is more efficient than some other HTML, JavaScript and uh, CSS. So it would be good to get sample files. So maybe if you can share customer files, you maybe can make up some files that have the same structure um, and, and just share it, share it with us and, and let us know what the performance is you get and what you would want to have. And then we could analyze uh, the project, the sample project, and find out whether it goes back to some HTML, JavaScript, or CSS, or whether it goes back to rather the PDF side of PDF chip. And if it does go back to the PDF side of PDF chip, then we can do anything about it. There are some things where I would still claim it's extremely fast, um, but maybe the bar some barcode generation might, might take a little bit of t uh, time. And it, it is true that for the computation of some barcodes, you actually need, need to do quite a number of calculations, especially for 2D codes for the error correction. And um, so it's a licensed the technology from Tacket, which is a specialized, that they only do barcodes. And they, they warn in our SDK documentation that if you do certain things in the area of error correction, it may take longer. Yeah? So it might be the case that this plays a role, and you would have to find out. So is it really the error correction part of the 2D code? Is it uh, barcode and 2D code generation in general that is slower than we would hope it uh, to be? Is it our PDF code? Is it something else? So we would have to identify exactly what it is. Uh, the good thing about 2D codes is you know it should have access to additional parameters for making 2D codes where you can control the level of error correction you're asking for. Maybe you don't want to give up and you want to have a high degree of error correction and you have to do all the, the math and the calculations. Then you would rather leave these things as they are, but maybe you don't. Maybe a computationally easier approach to providing error correction is just good enough and you save some of the time. But it's very difficult to tell. And uh, so please share a sample project that you're allowed to share from this project and you will definitely be interested in looking into it. Other questions? Anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> Maybe one more? Maybe one more? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Questions are really good.